think he said this remotely. Um, let's put it down to. Oh, and the uh, and the display won't track. Won't track it. So the display yeah. has no idea. That's a it. that's a. You have to kind of push it around, like from a. It's you can see where it's a weird thing to do. That's a generic problem with the way we do our um, WX and, and QT GUI uh, sliders yeah. and stuff like that. So if the QT GUI is not tracking the GRSP, not the other right. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. I mean, we can it's we can fix pulling. that. It's not pulling yet. It doesn't pull. It just gets yeah. It just pushes into the graph. When it's we we can fix that, but that's problem has nothing to do with the control board. Yeah. So. yeah. Just just want to point that out. Um. Okay. So then, when yeah, I guess we're let's go to the, uh, the code itself. Um, because when you're when you're actually just defining these things, um, there's a new component called gr dash control board. And it only, it, I think it's one dependency outside of like, it depends on the new radio core or eventually the new radio runtime. Um, but I think it's only internal dependency right now is ICE. Uh, and it's ICE 3.4 uh, is what we're running on right now. Um, What's the current version of ICE? It's ICE. 3.4, yeah. I think it's 3.4.2, but I'm, I'm yeah. guessing 3.4.x should be fine. Um, and I don't actually know the difference between the older versions of ICE. We might actually be able to track back, but I haven't really looked too far into that. But 3.4 has been out for a long time, actually, yeah. so it seems to be the, the, the easy way to look at things. So what happens is in, in the CMake, you know, if, if, control, if ICE is there, then we can build control for and we set this, and I, I create this um, uh, uh, define here for enable GR control for So if it's there, then, then this, these blocks can pull in. Um, the, the necessary header files for our control port, uh, in this case, this register helpers, uh, which we'll use in the C file. Down here, and actually, I was thinking about this last night, so, so Nick and I were talking about this, trying to figure out how do we push this, so a lot of this stuff back into um, it's a video radio uh, block or a basic block or something like this. This could actually now go back into a base block. This, you know, this could always be there and just not ever used because it's not dependent on control port, it's just it's a vector of boost any pointers. So um, it's pretty. It's a pretty generic little container for what we're going to expose later on. But that's, that could eventually become a... And you, yeah, you wouldn't even need to uh, test the control port variable there. Exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, until yesterday, there was a whole lot of machinery in there for a bunch of type defs and things. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. And so we, we cleaned that up dramatically by, by just using any pointers and, and a few other tricks. So then if we look at the, uh, the C file, um, what we do now is we have a set of RPC in the constructor, and he's just defined, I just kind of by convention define him at the end. Uh, so there's a set of the RPC. Internally, again, we protect against his control port enabled. If it is, then we, we export all these things. If it's not, they become, they, they just disappear from the code. Um, but the, the important things come in where we have to create these new registers. Um, and so there's gets up here, and then later on there's going to be a set. So we register the fact that this, um, specifically, this is the value that we're interested in. Or actually, that's the, um, that's the access, accessor function that we're interested in, that we're actually uh, attaching ourselves to. So error is a method of the clock sync block that returns the the inner, the private value of uh, what would be the error. There's a bunch of stuff around here. So between the name of the block, the unique ID of the block, the pointer to our cells, and then this is the, the name of the variable that gets exported, that's what defines how we, we kind of attach to it from the, the external control port. I think with we're, what we're working on now with these symbolic names, this, this becomes a lot simpler in a lot of ways. Then we tell it what we're actually attaching to. This is a min value, a max value, and a default value, just to give us some idea of the, the range that this, uh, um, this information is going to take. This is a string that's supposed to be the units of that value. Uh, and then here's a description. Um, we can talk about what the right way to handle these things are. It's pretty. It doesn't bother me, but you just have to kind of know what they are. Um, 
when you double click on something in that, right, this is just kind of a hint to whatever application you write. So when I double click on those values in that the control port monitor, if it was a, you know, this is a time series, a floating point time series app, so it's a single floating point. So that gives it a hint of what type of thing to automatically, by default, to, to pull up to the display. We could have, like when I run this, and I look at the rate, or the, the phase here, I could actually pull this up as a, uh, as a PSD, for whatever the hell that means for, uh, for that, but um, it should be filling in, yeah. You can see it slowly filling in one data sample at a time. There's nothing to stop you, but the, the little display hint is a, little, is a nicety that, that allows us to just double click and know what type of display it is. That's fairly minor. This is, I think, one of the more interesting things of control port that we haven't explored in depth a lot, which is the privilege level that, that you have when you're accessing this. So, so privilege level min is just the minimum privilege level. Essentially, anybody that attaches to that graph has the ability to view this variable. Or this uh, to to uh, to get this this function error. Um, we could change this level if we wanted to have like an admin level or something like that, and then there'd be some kind of credentials exchange, like an SSL certificate or something like that. Is that, is that built into ICE, or we'd have to code that? It's mostly built into ICE. There's a little that's I've been poking around at this recently. Um, there are these SSL is is attached into ICE pretty nicely in a lot of ways as long as you're working in C++ or Java. So for Python, you don't get to the SSL plugin. But... Ah, that's what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. so that's, that's you know, those, these are things that we're trying to figure out, I think, a little bit, how we actually want to want to handle them. But conceptually, the, the, the concept of having these privilege levels is great because, again, maybe your loop bandwidth is something that people want to be, like, you know, anybody in the world is, is able to see, but only you should be allowed to set. So you set the setter privilege level to be higher, and you associate that with like a, your particular certificate to, to you know, authenticate you and then allow you to, to set this. Um, but so again, you know, this is all boilerplate stuff. It all it has to be in the block because the way that the ICE system and, and the, the registration system happens, these templated functions are based on the block or the, the class itself. So there's no real way to push this back any farther. Uh, there's no way to kind of abstract it out because we have to know, you know, the the function itself, its data parameters, its you know these types of things all have to go into to the blocks. But it gives us that kind of control that every block that we want to instrument with control for, hopefully we can uh, uh, we add ourselves and whether or not there's a set or and or a get for that particular uh, uh, function. So again, we're just and we're just pushing these back onto um, onto this uh, boost any pointer. So it's just the container. Nobody ever touches these from the, the the block itself again. It just kind of registers it. Ice kind of, ice handles the fact that this has been registered and does every or control port it, uh, handles the fact that it's been registered and does everything in the background. We never touch these again, so we can just put them in these little opaque boost any pointers and never have to touch them again. And the fact that we cast it to a shared pointer means that the memory uh, cleanup is handled automatically when we uh, destroy this vector uh, uh, when the disruptor is called. So, I, I mean, same comment I had earlier uh, about the message passing stuff. We're using raw pointers again here. Um, are we sort of proving by inspection that we're going to be uh, destroying, you know, I, that, that we can get away with that and not use shared pointers here? We are using shared pointers. Well, no, you're passing this to the RPC basic S pointer. Oh, that, okay, that's, that's a good question. Yeah. But, but, that, get, but that gets torn down in the destructor. Too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's the same, same answer for both cases. It's just one of those things we should be careful about yeah. going back from shared pointers to using raw pointers. Oh, gotcha, okay, uh, I gotcha. It's yeah. just worth yeah. extra care in looking at the code. So I've done some gets, a bunch of gets for all the things here. Here's, a, here's my set. So the only thing that gets set here is uh, uh, I, I export the set loop bandwidth. So that was how I was able to pull up the property and have that slider to set if, uh, you know, the, the, um, the bandwidth there. Um, again, I'll give it the same privilege level now, but that's something we can, we can play with. So, so you think with the symbolic name stuff, um, that second line of the S pointer? Should Come down class. to just uh, the symbolic class. name and well, and the, the name of the the 
fact that this is me and Blue Team. Yeah. Yeah, just those two. Okay. Yeah. Um, and perhaps, and we have to look at the, the internals of it, perhaps that symbolic registry is also used in ICE to get the, the shared pointer out once we, once we use it. So it's possible, and these are mechanics that we need to yeah, figure yeah, yeah. out with this, with this whole symbolic naming concept. But it's possible that dename this and unique ID become one, this, the symbolic name, and everything gets pulled out from there. Yeah. But we'll, we'll see if that, that works. Um, what else to say about this? I feel like those are the, that's the main, the main thing, yeah. So again, uh, as we're going forward, if, as we, we want to access or expose things to control for from a, a block, we're going to basically have to copy a lot of this stuff into your, into every block. Um, so, so I have some questions about some probably pretty low level bits. Um, the flow graph now has uh, something that is listening on a socket um, and it's receiving uh, data from the control application and it has to respond. When it replies on that TCP socket, if that socket blocks, how does that impact anything running into the flow graph? You know, there's a network outage and it's you know, blocked trying to send data for 30 seconds. Is that going to impact anything in the flow graph operation? No, it's a separate thread. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's just one of the... Unless you do something in your accessor functions that locks the block. So have you, have you run any, run this with hardware, you know, real-time applications and stuff and not throttles? It doesn't affect it negatively. Unless somebody's actively pulling it, it pretty much just in class, like it doesn't exist. Cool. Tom, just wondering if you might indulge the viewers at home, could you show the client application again, the control application? So unfortunately, we missed that for the video. So uh, before I start that, what happens when uh, when something, when a block in the flow graph is instrumented with control port, so channel model, the clock sync and this complex probe all are control port enabled uh, blocks. That kicks off the control port thread back end to, to register an endpoint, so this ICE endpoint, and, uh, um, and start exposing it. And by convention right now, we just we spit that information out there that says, I've created an endpoint, a uh, video radio endpoint on a TCP socket on this host, which is just my, my uh, Ethernet. Um, IP address right now, and I've just created this new port uh, to access. So it's a random port number at this point that we expose. So that gets that gets pushed out there, which means that other control port monitor systems or other applications that have been instrumented to be able to talk ICE uh, to to this can now use that information, that IP address, and the port number. And like I said, if I if I open up my firewall to allow that port to be accessed from the outside, somebody else could, could attach to it. So is there any way to configure that currently from ERC or wh like which IP address it should? Be? Yeah, I was just thinking that, and I because because it's great because it seems it handles it pretty uh, conveniently, except that this doesn't exist on anywhere but between me and the user. So yeah, if, you, if you have multiple uh, Ethernet ports, or yeah, whatever. I'm gonna have to yeah. Bind it on or if you've got to poke a hole in a firewall. On every interface right now. Oh, that's right. It just does every. So what I should be able to do, let's see if I can see if this actually works. What is it? Four three seven one nine four. So I've actually just uh, on, again this is just local and everything. I just um, ran the control port monitor. Control port dash monitor, and I've attached a, another running flow graph to, uh, or another running app monitor to the same flow graph. So this is just our simple flow graph up here um, that only does control the noise and the phase of a constellation. So I can, again, looking at the complex probe as a constellation plot, uh, if I change the phase, we should, uh, yeah, because I probably didn't. Yeah, I don't actually change the. 
based on the noise of your fish movements. Okay. That's just the facility roll. But I can change the noise. Um, we could also we could look at this guy and say, what's the we can plot him in time. Actually, let's plot him as a complex time. So we can see this guy running and do all of our and use I, I re-outfitted everything so that they use the same QT uh, GUI plots that we use in Vita Radio. So now everybody kind of uses the same kind of back end. Uh, so on the, tools. is the control port monitor application a good running the Vita Radio flow graph itself? No. Okay. Well, actually, I'm sorry. It is in this case to to get access to that. It's running a limited. It, it basically takes in the, that vector, creates a simple. Mm -hmm. You know, vector source plops the vector in there, creates right. the GUI, runs it. And so you, you, you sort of have a, a, a flow graph over over the network. Yeah. Which is, is a very powerful concept. Yeah. Yeah. So, so could I, if I had like a bunch of FM receivers on, you know, embedded devices scattered around the U.S., could I actually turn on and off audio and have it be like monitor audio with this sort of thing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mo that would be monitor, of course, because you're not going to get the full stream, but you, no, you could I, get like chunks of, you know. I, obviously the application is like, you know, for internet scanners. Yeah, okay, yeah. I could make an internet scanner, and then people go to my website and listen to the various voice frequencies. Like, I'm not... Yeah, I'm not sure. Well, see, this goes back to it, you wouldn't get you wouldn't want to listen to sort of a continuous stream on this. Yeah, but uh, you could get a first. So you, you'd want you to look at the performance of all of them all in one place. Yeah. You could. I, I, I can see how it state. would be popular to want to consolidate, you know, streams of demodulated stuff in one place. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes back to the comment I made earlier, which is this is a. People are going to want to stream data. This is get and set, but you also want to have the ability to deliver data that comes yeah. out of a flow graph on a continual basis. Yeah. It's, it's going to come up. It's, right. it's, yeah, you're right. I mean, because the internet can stream audio. If the internet can stream audio, this feature should stream audio. Is my argument. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to think, like, how you just have a separate UDP block? I'm just, but it would be nice to only have one. Yeah, one yeah, range. no, I, I, I think thinking about the ability to, instead of having a polling get me the latest, have the ability to deliver unsolicited events um, you know, would, would be a, a nice extension to this. People are going to ask for it constantly. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if a hack would be um, use the, kind of the probe thing to pull out. I think the right thing to do is to get this in and stable. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we're, we're, that. Yeah, you, you tell us something good and we're always asking for more. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in a, in a completely different vein, since top block is just another block, and all this is in the basic block stuff, I presume, um, we could add some debugging functions to top block and expose them via this, and then you could go look at statistics of your flow graph. Yes and no. The problem is that control port right now depends on Vita Radio Core, which is where GR Top Block is. So GR Top Block doesn't have the ability to know anything about control port as an external thing. Uh, the way to fix that, because it's not a bad idea to be able to do, would be to put to get rid of GR control port as a separate component, put it into GR runtime, but still have all of the CMake mechanisms to not install it, you know. That, yeah, I think that would, that would I think it would work quite well. I don't know how many how much code is involved, uh, but uh, it should be doable. That, that so, actually would be very. So, so you could you could debug a, a remote flow graph in real time, potentially even stopping and starting it, um, and looking at statistics. Um, right. That that's a that's a huge feature for a large scale project. Yeah. If you're going to do a big LTE base station in your radio. You're going to want to be able to. Do that, and this, this really opens up a lot of possibilities because you get the introspection into the, yeah. what's going yeah. on, yeah. the live access from a separate machine, yeah. and uh, it, it really it, it also answers a lot of what the SCA people have been touting for years, which um, you know or, you know th those sorts of middleware type capabilities. Yeah. So this 
this is really yeah no that's 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 that's, that's good um, and it sh it should be possible to move all the scenic stuff into Community Radio Core we'll probably do it in chair runtime yeah we're yeah yeah no, I mean I'm glad this is all coming up now because yeah. I'm gonna uh, pause work on that for a little bit till uh, um, uh, I mean we could even go so far as to like uh, have default um, functions for at the, like the GR block level to be able to go query what is your you know sample count on this port um, you know things like that that the user doesn't have to instrument because they're instrumented in the pa uh, in the parent class mm -hmm. and then all blocks would have these things you could query on them yeah. you know just because they derive from GR block or from sync block or something yeah yeah very good uh, one thing to point out before I get into this. ICE runs on this thing called Slice, which is their language. Um, so this can read it. Ice. This is what it uses to set up its its ability to know what data types are. It's C-like in a way. You know, we're just creating these classes to, to know what a knob B means and a knob C means, um, and, and vectors of them as such. Uh, but more importantly, when we get down here, yeah, I guess we need to know these type uh, these enumerators that, that are used in both sides of the code. Um, down here we have the interface. So the interface is essentially is, is very simple right now. We could, so what you do is you can create a, a list, a, kind of a, a yeah, parameterized list of knobs that are available. So when you when you pull uh, the the running application, you get this list of the, of the knobs, and then you can kind of parse that to, to pull out everything. Uh, or you can actually give it. Well, I don't want to give too many details. This is essentially this is the way of creating an interface to the the running program. All we do right now is have a set and a get, and we whatever running in the program, whatever blocks have to have control port variables exposed, get pushed into those sets and those gets. It could be very possible and possibly uh, 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 preferable at some point to have very specific interfaces like. Um, well, what's a good like top block? Start and stop. Yeah, start and stop. Right, we can yeah. create a start and stop interface. Yeah. So instead of having to like construct this whole dictionary to push into like the set function, you just say you just call the the, the start or stop function of that that's exposed to this interface concept. Um, so this this could put, this could potentially grow this concept of using the slice language and what interface we've created for our, our control ports could potentially grow. The QA code is fairly instructive uh, in how everything is used. So you know we have to we have to know import ice the, the Python ice uh, module. We're going to get our control port um, uh, uh, Python swing uh, uh, module, and then here we're uh, we've got the preferences. So these dot ice files these are the slice files. They have to exist somewhere in the system. They're installed and they're pushed into our um, our preferences config file so we know where to access them because what you do is using uh, ice you um, basically have to compile the these um, kind of uh, almost a JIT. Well, so does right. the user have to write these ice files or there's an ice file that's just pretty much there's or... one ice file you okay. could write your own specifically for your given application and use okay. that it's another type of data that you're trying to push around okay um, but for the most part we can just use the standard uh, and then, so, when, so what can you radio that ice does? It creates a, a Python class locally called can you radio. And so this is where you get the interface from. Um, coming down here, I'm going to skip over a lot of this stuff because you know, this is more interesting. So what I've done is I've created a source with two probes. I connect them up and I, I run start. So this guy is, is uh, operating. And here we go down here. I, this is where we get the endpoints. So that GNU radio with the, the host IP address and the port number, uh, we can just query the, this, the local system to see what endpoints we have. And I'm just going to get the first endpoint out of a list of possible endpoints. Now there's going to be only one in this example. Um, that's specifically specified that. This, again, uh, you know, just exposing this, if you want, you know, look at the ICE documents, look at the ICE uh, um, manuals to understand what a lot of this means. But most importantly is this running monitor here, this is just one possible way of, that we've created to get people started, to just expose whatever is, is in uh, the running flow graph. But there's a lot more that you can do with it. And this gives you a little bit of insight 
and how to initiate an ICE client to talk to the running flow graph. Um, and so, so you create these port proxies. Uh, so the radio is now a proxy to this new radio slice interface concept that we've created from this endpoint. And so what we do is we just do call this radio.get. So we know that there's a .get because the slice file has, has told us that it's there. Um, and by giving it a blank string, it's going to give us all possible uh, um, exposed parameters or exposed variables that are running in this uh, current radio graph right now. And we just iterate through all the keys and see what's in there. So I just want to point this out if you guys are getting into it that you know the, the control board monitor, that's one application. Here's another way to look at um, at doing a very simple interface, uh, client-side interface to, uh, to a running control board system. And then you can just take this data and the sets and the gets and the interfaces and go from there. Don't laugh, but it would be kind of nice to have an end curses version of that uh, monitor as well. <laughs> there, is, there is one. Oh, there is one. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, so... <laughs> Cool. So I um, is that was that all you had on? Yeah, I think so. Unless there's another question.